whales, the clams, and the octopus, and the squids. And, and the, you see there the gradation from very simple eyes, very simple, just a few cells in, in uh, li li uh, limpets, to very elaborate eyes like ours in a squids and octopus. They have a camera eyes mm -hmm. like ours, but they don't have a defect that we had. Because of the way the eye evolved in vertebrates, the nerve forms inside the eye cavity. So to reach the brain, to pass the information from the retina to the brain, has to cross the retina, which is how we have a blind spot. Octopuses and squids don't have this problem because the, the, nerve, the, eye, the eye nerve forms in the outside. So it goes directly to the brain without having a blind spot. Proof definitive according to the proponents of intelligent design that God loves squids and octopuses more than humans. <laughs> <laughs> well, uh, let, me, uh, let me make uh, Dennis Lamoureux uncomfortable with the same question I asked uh, Dr. Scott just a moment ago. You were at one point in the, in the creationist camp. What changed your mind? Was there well, an epiphany? Let, let me tell you, I was in medical school at the University of Toronto in 1983, and I was wrestling with this, this issue. And, um, I was a young earth creationist and I walked out of medical school to become a creation scientist to actually go after people just like this. Um, the story's a long one. It's, it's basically 13 years of graduate school. And, you know, I'm, I'm an evangelical Christian and I will say that when I made this move there was a sense of calling. But in that sense of calling, before I went to the Institute of Creation Research, and I wrote my letters to Dwayne Gish and, and Henry Morris, there was a sense of if I was going to deal in this business, how about having a hard look at what's going on in Genesis, those early chapters. So I became a specialist in Genesis 1 to 11. And what happened was the surprise of my life, that reading Genesis is a lot more complicated than what I learned in my evangelical Sunday schools. And so the process started there, realizing my faith didn't move a bit. My approach to Genesis, I started seeing things I never saw before. And then following a degree in, in theology, a PhD in theology, there was still this wrestling with evolution. And I thought, well, what about doing a PhD in evolutionary biology in teeth and jaws, which is some of the very best evolutionary evidence. And I came in as under the radar as a skeptic. And after three and a half years of seeing the data day in and day out, I learned two things. Number one, not all evolutionary bi biologists are raging atheists and mean-spirited atheists. In fact, the department head was Reverend Dr. David Payton, an ordained Anglican minister who was also an evolutionist. And then two, I mean, I went little by little after three and a half years of seeing the data. I just kept seeing more evolutionary evidence. At first, I was like the little boy at the dike. I could sort of block it out and give a counter argument, and then it just kept coming over and over. So finally, I just put my hands up in the air, and I'm not the only one who said this and has gone through this process. And you'll hear the O word from me, that the evidence for biological evolution is simply overwhelming. Now, the advantage I had to see that is I had this approach, and that was going through theology, realizing, and, I, and I'm going to give my faith, I believe the Bible's Holy Spirit inspired and that the Holy Spirit went and inspired at the level of the ancient people. So in other words, was not providing modern science, but rather using an ancient understanding of nature. And from there, I was able to accommodate, if you wish, both my science and my theology and look at evolutionary biology in the following way. That, and I ask this to Christians. You know, when you were being created in your mother's womb, do you ever think of the Lord coming out of heaven and putting on an arm or putting on a leg? I've yet to meet a Christian who said yes. Well, rather, we see ourselves in that wonderful Psalm 139 being knit fearfully and wonderfully together in the womb. And so I look at evolutionary biology in the very same way. Evolution is, is God's process through which we create. So I do the analogy from the womb to life overall. Um, let me turn to you, Francisco Ayala. Was there a moment when you said, wait a minute, or were you educated to see that there was no contradiction? I was educated to see no contradiction. I grew up in Spain, uh, Franco's Spain, we had a dictatorship, and the nation was officially Catholic. I went to a Catholic school. The first science class that I had was about the equivalent of about seventh grade in the United States, was taught by a priest, Father Pedro, and he talked about science in general, many subjects, and about evolution too. And they never in my schooling, there was any perception, there was a contradiction between religion and evolution. 
It's interesting. Uh, we mentioned the dates on which you served on the Presidential Advisory Board, which, were, of course, were during the Bush administration. I'm not going to draw any parallels to Francisco Spain. Yet uh, <laughs> some of the people that you may have met on that panel uh, certainly don't hold your views. No. Uh, I served in the panel of advisors of science and technology during the eight years of the Clinton administration. Oh, you'll forgive me. Yeah. I was presented the National Medal of Science by President Bush in the first year of his presidency at the White House. But the one with whom we work, actually we work mostly with, with Vice President Gore, on occasionally uh, the president will come to sit with us and, and be interested in some of the topics that we were discussing as advisors. It was definitely Clinton, not Bush. And, and that group of people is a very interesting group of people. I think could be <laughs> very similar to the three of us. We, we have a range of people from being top-notch scientists, three or so Nobel laureates, and several people who were quite religious, a couple of them at least, and most others who in any case do not so, do, do not, did not see any contradiction between religion and science. So this issue of uh, the apparent contra or perceived con contradiction by some people between evolution and religion never arose there as a subject that required discussion. We were all in agreement. We, if we refer to it, would be as a social phenomenon. Hmm. Uh, Dr. Scott, uh, you've written that uh, although Americans may doubt evolution, and public opinion polls tell us that a quite sizable percentage of Americans do, you think they are reachable. How? Huh. Maybe one of my character flaws is, is, is an optimism that that's, looks toward the future. I think ultimately, whether you accept or reject a scientific idea has to do with your understanding of the idea and also has to do with what um, precepts you might bring in or, 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 or already hold when you are presented that idea. In order to get people to accept evolution, or you, they have to understand it. And what I find is that most people really don't know what evolution is. Um, I have a colleague who teaches at a uh, community college in one of the southeastern states, which I will not mention. And uh, she told me that um, you know, this is a college level class, so of course you teach evolution. You know, evolution is not controversial at the college level. It's taught routinely at every university, including places like Baylor and Brigham Young and Notre Dame and places like that. And, uh, but she had these students in her class who, who had never, never learned anything about evolution. When th those chapters of the book came up, the teacher just kind of passed over them and went on to other topics. And, but, you know, this college, so she just taught evolution matter-of-factly. After a couple of weeks, a couple of these students came up to her and said, well, well, of course species change through time. You mean that's evolution? <laughs> we thought evolution meant you can't believe in God. And I get this regularly, not just at, from high school teachers, but I even get, get it told it by college teachers. And I'm a former college professor myself, and I ran into that idea. The big idea of evolution is that living things shared common ancestors, that there is this huge genealogical tree of life that relates all living things together. That is in direct contradiction to one religious idea that God specially created everything in its present form. Indeed. You know, if, if that's your view of creation, evolution isn't going to work for you. But as my colleagues, uh, who are both Christians, have pointed out, there's more than one Christian view. And actually, the best kept secret in this whole controversy is the majority of Christians, Catholics and mainstream Protestants, accept evolution as the way God did it. So I think what we need is we need better understanding of what evolution really is. Mm -hmm. We also need better understanding of the difference between science and religion, which is sort of what we're working up to here on this panel. But we also need, I think, um, uh, more theological understanding. I think most people don't really understand the view toward evolution that their own denomination holds. Well, uh, Dr. Lamar, let me turn to you, uh, because to some degree this is also a reaction of people saying, you are telling me what to believe. You are telling me I must believe this, and I don't hold with that. Yeah, and you know, I respect that, and I, and I never tell people what to believe. I mean, 
my pedagogical technique or teaching technique is as follows.